Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly Q&A session. You ask the technical related mountain bike stuff and we hopefully give you the answers you need. Get your questions in, in those comments right down there. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and we'll feature you on the show. Uh, first up this week is from SMDNG. Um, does cycling make you shorter? Uh, after frequent commuting on my hardtail, I feel like I'm engaging a riding posture whilst not doing anything involving a bike. Ah, uh, right, okay, so you get elements of this if you're working in an office because you hunch over your computer and it's really bad for your posture. Um, and it's similar with cycling, especially urban cycling, and if you use drop handlebars, for example. So if you look at our road riding friends over at GCN, not so much them, but a lot of people that have ridden road for a long, a long time, you can get bad posture because your shoulders drop down, you hunch your back, uh, a combination of those sort of things. You do need to make sure you do some sort of training and some stretching away from the bike. Uh, you know, just before you go riding a bike, you should make sure you stretch all your muscles out and the same afterwards. And also, if you only cycle for fitness, it's not the best because cycling can have an effect on some muscles that's not quite so good for you. For example, the hip flexor. So that is at the top of your thigh and it connects it to your pelvis. Uh, in cyclists, these get quite strong and by doing so, they get quite short. Because of the way that we ride our bikes and we pull up on our pedals and we cycle so aggressively, the shortening of these actually hampers the use of your glutes out back and it can lead to backache and again, posture position problems. If you look at some, um, maybe some skinny old cyclists that have been riding, you know, perhaps since the 60s or whatever, you will see a bit of a trend that some of them do have a slight hunch, like a sort of a hunchback almost to it. I mean, no offense to these guys, they're people who have been cycling for a long time, but it is a bit of a downside to sport if you only do this. So it's really important to have some off the bike activities. Uh, pretty much, I think this is why cyclocross was invented. Uh, and the act of this was so that road cyclists had spent so much time in the saddle in the early days, they needed a cross training way of riding in the off season so they could run and they could do different stuff to engage different muscles to make sure they're using their bodies effectively to help stop things like this. Um, basically, what you need to do is just do a bit of work away from the bike, some, some basic stuff. Core stretching and stuff is really important, so perhaps yoga or Pilates or something like that might be good for you. Oh, this is a good one. So this one is from Booth Timex. What do you think of Salsa's split pivot at the rear axle on the chainstay frame? Is it real? Uh, does it cause more maintenance. Um, okay, well firstly, Booth, um, yes, it's absolutely real, and the split pivot is a licensed bit of technology. It was designed by Dave Weagle. Uh, he's the same guy that designed the DW Link, which you can see on pivot bikes, on Ibis bikes, uh, on Iron Horse bikes back in the day. Uh, he also designed a Delta system, which is used by uh, Evil bikes. And he also is one of the designers behind the Trust linkage fork. Uh, they make the shout and the message. Uh, he's been around the block, basically. He knows his stuff. The split pivot is something that he's designed, and it's essentially a concentric pivot that goes around your rear wheel axle. And the effect of this is when you use it on a single pivot bike, like that Salsa that you're talking about, and the same actually with Da Vinci's and a few other bikes that also use the split pivot. The idea is, is it's a single pivot bike, except the braking, as in when you slow down and use your rear brake on it, it doesn't have any effect on the rear suspension by having that pivot there. If you were to have your brake, for example, on the seat stay in the normal position, it firms up the suspension when you're braking. Um, that's not the best thing to happen, and it's why a lot of bike manufacturers go for the four bar design, which basically by having the horse link, which is the chainstay mounted link, you're putting the the brake on a different part of the rear suspension so it's less affected. So by having a split pivot that is based around that rear wheel axle, you have still effectively a, basically a single pivot bike but it's not affected by braking. Uh, they're very good, they don't require any more maintenance than anything else. Uh, but interestingly, uh, Trek have a similar design called the ABP. Uh, visually, it looks the same at a glance, it's called the Active Braking Pivot and I think there are actually some court issues with um, Dave Weagle and Trek way back in the day but I think it was settled out the fact that they both designed them at a similar time, they both work in a similar way, but the suspension action is still slightly different between the two. Um, it's a good solid choice. Um, yeah, get involved. No reason to not, not, it works. All right, next one is from Max Eastwood. Hi Max. Um, I've been looking at some new rock shots, looking at the Yari, solid fork that. 
And I want to know the difference between the Debonair and the Solo Airspring and which is better in my opinion. Um, okay, well, they're both very good systems. The Solo Air is slightly older, uh, very dependable, and it works really well. Uh, as with all suspension systems, the key to it working well is keeping it clean and keeping it lubricated. Uh, that's just as important between the two styles. The Debonair is a slightly newer system and it essentially has a bigger negative air chamber. The effect of that is off the top, it's a little bit more linear just initially, so it's very grippy and it's very active. It will feel supple. You'll hear some people say it's buttery, even over bumps. Basically, it feels a lot nicer on the smaller stuff. Um, and it is a better system, but it's not a million times better than a Solo Air. So if it's coming down to cost for you, um, Go for the Solo Air. It's, it costs less and it works very well, provided you keep it clean. Uh, but the Debonair is slightly more refined. Uh, now into chain length from MTB Sunday Riders. Hi, I want to know more about chains. Firstly, is the number of links so important? Secondly, can I use a 10 speed chain with my 11 speed cassette? And thirdly, can I use a different brand chain to my cassette? Um, plus, are there any more important things I need to know about chains? Okay, well firstly, uh, let's just look at the length of the chain. It, right, so it really does matter, the length of your chain. If it's too long, you're gonna get a slackness in the chain. Uh, you'll especially notice this if you have a short cage or a medium cage derailleur, in which case if you're using, say for example, um, a smaller or a higher gear at the rear and the same at the front, you're gonna be left with a bit of droop in the chain. Whereas if you're gonna have a long cage derailleur, it can take up the slack in the chain a lot more. So a little bit more forgiving to the amount of chain that you run. It's crucial when you run a small or a medium cage. Now another limitation of having a short or a medium cage is you don't get the full spread of gears basically for the opposite reason. So they can't carry enough chain to get the chain around say a SRAM Eagle cassette. Uh, that's a huge 50 tooth at one end and a tiny 10 tooth at the other end. You think of the difference in the length of chain it takes to wrap around those. The short cage derailleurs simply cannot carry it enough to basically take up the slack at one end and give you enough at the other end. So chain length really does matter. Also, in the realm of suspension bikes, there's another thing with chain length. If your chain is too short, it really hampers the feel of some suspension designs, in particular ones that suffer or have chain growth as part of that suspension system. Um, it also can mean, in a severe case, if you were, your chain was extremely short and the derailleur was stretched, you could snap the derailleur off or even snap the chain in the course of a big bottom out or an impact where everything is stretched to the absolute max. I have seen it happen before, someone mangled up a derailleur with a chain they'd had to basically just join on a ride and take a link out of. Uh, so do take care with that sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure we've actually made a video on the correct length of chain, because there is a formula for working it out. Um, I'll have a word of Henry and we'll get a script together on that one. Um, second question though, um, Unofficially, yes. Uh, it's not ideal and it can cause premature wear because there are slight differences between the thickness of the chains. So 10 speed is 5.62 millimeters thick and 11 speed is 5.88 millimeters thick. Now, they do work. Uh, the manufacturers might tell you otherwise, but they do. I can tell you this because I've got Rat Biker home and it has a SRAM 10 speed derailleur on it. It has a Shimano 10 speed cassette on it. It has a KMC 11 speed chain on it and it's got a SRAM 11 speed shifter on it. Uh, a right bodge of stuff. Now, I'm well aware that it's not gonna be doing it the best of good because it can prematurely wear, wear things out. However, it will work and it does work. Um, so that's up to you if you wanna do that, but you're always best to keep within the realms of the relevant speeds, so 10 speed on 10 speed, 11 speed on 11 speed. The bigger difference though is when you step down to 12 speed or step up to 12 speed, because uh, the chains are 5.25, um, so they're much, much thinner. So there's not a chance of 11 speed really working that way around. But between 10 and 11, you can basically make it work. Um, the only thing I would say on top of all those things, what you ask for anything else to know is measure the length of your chain quite regularly or the chain wear. Get yourself a chain wear indicator tool. They let you know if the pitch of your chain has changed at all. So you'll hear a term called chain stretch. Now chains don't physically stretch. Um, basically the, it's impossible for the actual plates of a chain to stretch. You have inner plates and you have outer plates. You have pins that go through the middle, join them together, and then you have a roller. And the roller is what contacts on the inside of your chain ring teeth or your sprockets on the bike. Now those rollers wear, and as they wear, the distance between the pins, the pitch of the chain, can move minutely. That is a phenomenon called chain stretch. 
Um, so you heard it here, that's how it works. And the downside of your chain when you do get a stretched chain is those rollers aren't any longer sitting on the correct part of the chain ring, they'll be wearing on the teeth. So they make that trough a lot wider, a lot bigger, and they're gonna wear all of your transmission out a lot faster. So what you wanna do is basically me measure your chain using a chain wear tool and replace it as soon as it gets within the sort of parameters of what a chain wear indicator tool says is worn, you should replace it. The reason for that is that you could potentially get two or three chains use out of your whole drivetrain. Whereas if you run just the one chain, you're gonna be wearing it all out. So replace it sooner rather than later. Um, and one last hot tip with chains, thinking about stress that you put through your chain when you ride a bike. All of that torque goes straight into that one tiny part. So you'd be doing yourself a favor if you just inspect your chain from time to time. Uh, when you run some lube over your chain, just look at every single link. Uh, the good way to do this is find the joining link. It looks a bit different to the rest of them on a the chain. Start there and work your way back around to that link. And what you're looking for is any of those outer plates, if they're just peeling away a tiny bit, sort it out straight away because that is where a chain will snap. And chains only ever snap when they're under immense power, which means you'll be thrown over the handlebars and you could do yourself an injury. So for your own sake, check your chain. All right, over to Rain Webster 13. I'm looking at getting a downhill bike and I'm stuck on what size to get. So currently I'm stuck between a small and a medium. Um, the bike manufacturer recommends a small, uh, but it's 10 mil shorter in reach. Um, I could get a small stem, go for the medium, uh, which works out that bit longer. Um, what would you do with a downhill bike? Go for the smaller or the longer reach? I mean, you're asking the wrong person, kind of, because I would always recommend someone to go for a longer bike than a shorter bike, especially something you're gonna be smashing down the hillside, down steep, rough stuff. A longer bike will be to your benefit. However, um, when it comes to bike sizing, you're the one that really needs to sit on it because your preference is different to mine and different to everyone else's. You will know when you sit on the two bikes what feels right, but I do appreciate that it's not always an option to sit on that. Um, like trail bikes, downhill bikes are getting longer. So if there's an option for you to have a shorter stem and go for the longer bike, I'd probably say do that, to be honest. Um, downhill bikes are only going one way, they're getting longer and they're getting faster. Um, so if you're able to, don't be stuck on the smaller, go for the medium. Um, I think it's probably a better option for you. Okay, next is from, ooh, I hope it's not the real one, from Freddy Krueger. Um, hi guys, what do you think about the DT Swiss Ratchet upgrade? Okay, so I guess you mean the one that goes from the 18 tooth up to the 54 tooth. So uh, in, in case people aren't sure about what we're talking about, there's two types of DT free where you get the traditional system, which has uh, pulls on there, uh, three or four pull systems, and then you get the ratchet style. The ratchet has two rings, basically, and they've got serrated teeth on them, and the springs force them together, basically, to grip. And you get bigger ones and smaller ones, or uh, thicker ones and finer ones. So the stock one is 18 tooth, is quite indestructible, to be honest, and I think this is probably gonna be where I'm gonna go in with this, uh, versus the 54 tooth one. So the 54 tooth one, I think the engagement is, let me just check, uh, is 6.5 degrees between engagement, whereas on the 18 tooth one, the stock one, it is 20 degrees, so a very, very different thing. So it's a much more high performance option but something you need to bear in mind with that upgraded one is it really isn't for everyone it's definitely great for low friction riding it's great for cross country stuff like that but if you're the sort of rider that smashes around on those pedals all the time does gate starts and things like that might not be the best because those there's a lot more of those teeth and they're a lot shallower so they can be a lot easier to damage or perhaps they might wear out faster for that style of riding um, I would probably be inclined to say stick to the 18 tooth because it works great. Um, but if you don't mind a bit of maintenance, that you know is very easy with those. You literally just pull them off, clean them. Uh, they come with their own grease, special grease for those three wheels that stays in place, but it's quite thin to allow them to move over each other. Um, then it would work fine. Um, just take that into, uh, into account what I said though about the teeth being a bit shallower than they are on the 18. The 18 are really like clunk, 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 clunk and on the 54 they're really like Zzz. So great sound, but perhaps not the best for all users. 
Uh, there we go, there's another clinic in the bag. If you've got any questions, let us know in those comments. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna throw you to another couple of videos. Uh, first one is uh, right down here, five common questions. Uh, you guys helpfully give us loads of questions, so here's five that we commonly get asked. Um, if you've got any comments on those, let us know in these comments underneath. And over here, I'm gonna throw you to workshop mistakes. Uh, a bit of fun, some of the stuff you shouldn't do, and some stuff that we've all done that we definitely shouldn't do, uh, including using flip-flops in a workshop. Never do that. Uh, as always, give us a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell. Cheers guys.